<laughs> and, and thank you so much, Dee Dee, for, for um, just sharing about Ruth. Um, I was devastated when she passed away. Um, I, I didn't know how we were going to move forward without her uh, on that Supreme Court. And uh, but I realized that that she fought so hard up until her last breath, fighting for uh, this country, fighting for women's rights, um, fighting for people like 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 me. And so um, thank you all for for continuing to honor her legacy. I stand on her shoulders. You know, I stand on the shoulders of so many uh, women who came before her, like my great grandmother, Rebecca Brown Crutcher. Uh, and so again, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Uh, I was just on the phone with Pastor Marlon before uh, um, I got back on here. He was with, with us today, uh, fighting for Greenwood, standing with uh, the oldest last known living survivor, Mother Viola Fletcher, and uh, Pastor Marlon always answers the bell. And so you all couldn't have a better leader um, who, who, who fights for um, the least of these and, and for equity and for justice um, for, for everyone. And so I'm, I'm just blessed to be connected um, to all souls and to this church. And I, I just can't forget what you all um, have done for me and my family since the murder of Terrence. You all you, you stood in solidarity with us on your family and friends day. You, you take the time to, to, to keep Terrence's name alive and, and you sow seed into our, our growing organization. And I remember last year when George Floyd was killed, um, when we felt like we had to actually take it to the streets like every other city in this nation uh, and around the world, you all were there. You were our, our, our safety net. You know, you had beds and blankets and food and water and, and you made sure we were okay. We were just that comfortable going out there because we knew um, that you all had our back. And so uh, I just can't say enough about um, this organization. When you talk about allyship and white allies, you all are not just performative. You all actually walk your talk. Um, and, and I know it's still a, you know, the biggest room in the, the world is room for improvement and we all have to grow um, this this fight and this this growth thing or, or really trying to understand or get to a place of cultural competency is a daily continual process. It's a lifelong process. And so I appreciate you all uh, standing in solidarity with 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 us uh, in this fight for justice for black and and brown people. Um, <laughs> What can I say? Where do I start? Uh, I, I feel like I found myself on the front lines of every single fight, every issue of inequity um, uh, in this city, in this state. And you know, five years later, I, I feel like, man, is it getting worse? I, I think about the 58th session at the Oklahoma legislature. You all have seen the bills being signed into the law. Um, it's just egregious. I mean, House Bill 1775, this critical race theory bill, uh, House Bill 1674, where drivers can run over protesters for exercising their First Amendment rights, their right to assemble, their right to rally cry, their right to protest, and so many more bills that, that, that force people who are incarcerated to pay for their own mental health services immigration bills, bills affecting the LBGTQ community. I mean, where do we start? You think about RGB and, and all the work that she did to progress us and get us to a place where we could really, um, um, you know, live free. And, and it's like, they're trying to, to take us back 100 years. And so I think that's where I'll start going back 100 years. You all, uh, Pastor Marlon, I know he's been on the front line of, of this fight for, for repair and, and restitution. Uh, he's met with a lot of the survivors. There's only three living. Um, but when I think about what happened to my twin brother, Terrence Crutcher, and what propelled me to jump into this movement space, I, my background is healthcare. I had my own outpatient orthopedic clinic in rural Alabama, the black belt of Alabama, right outside of Montgomery, uh, a county called Bullitt County, a little small town called Union Springs, Alabama. My mission was to go to underserved communities and help with 
with, with the, the disparities that, that African-Americans faced as it related to access to health care and, and, and things of that nature. I saw too many people who looked like me dying early of lifestyle diseases, diseases that could be prevented simply because they didn't have access to proper care or access to proper education uh, and, and things of that nature. And so I went to, to, to Alabama and I worked hard and you know, I built up the community, I developed relationships, and I felt like I was an activist and an advocate in that space. And then after Terrence passed away, um, I was dividing my time between Tulsa and Montgomery, and I started to get weary, I started to get tired, and I felt like this fight needed me more, this fight on ground needed me more. And so I decided to, to, to take a sabbatical from, from healthcare and found myself running a foundation, the Terrence Crutcher Foundation that's growing exponentially. Um, and this isn't a foundation or organization that was birthed out of capacity or infrastructure. We didn't have anything, we didn't have any funding. Um, it was birthed out of necessity. I saw the need here in this city. You know, I, I started to truly embrace my why. What was my why? You know, why do I do what I do? And, and and I always say, if your why doesn't make you cry, it's not strong enough. And I started to look at Terrence's children. And I started to look at the other children in this community. And I saw the gaps and I saw the needs. And I said, this is my why. I can't change my twin brother's faith, but I can make sure and I can fight like hell and I can pull from the resilience and the strength of, of a Ruth Ginsburg and, and make sure that I channel that same strength and energy and fight like hell to make sure that Terrence's children and, and little boys and little girls that look like Terrence doesn't have his same fate. And so I started to just really to, you know, dive deep head first and haven't looked back since. And of course, I started to think about this thing called systemic racism. And, and started studying Brian Stevenson and his work around lynching and, and racial terror violence and, and America's ugly past and history. And I started doing deeper dives and, and I, I started to find out that, man, this is just the evolution of history, starting with the Jim Crow era and, and then the, the, the civil rights movement and, and then mass incarceration and the war on drugs and now police brutality and we can go on and on and on. And, and I looked at the women's suffrage move, all of these things, I, I realized that it was just the evolution and, and the culture really hasn't changed. We've had women, I think, who's led a lot of the fights. Yeah, we saw Martin Luther King, we saw a lot of men uh, as the face, but what people don't realize, there were a lot of women behind the scenes, like a Ella Baker who had to organize, who had to do the typing. When I think about the Montgomery bus boycott, it was the women who organized that. And old women, elders who walked for 389 days because they said they were gonna draw a line in the sand and they were gonna stand firm on what they believed. And so they truly understood what it meant to disrupt to disrupt systems that didn't serve them well, that didn't benefit them. And, and, and a lot of young people, and, and if young people, if you're listening, if you'll watch this, I want you to really listen to this. A lot of those young people back then, they told those elders and those mothers and, and those women, we don't want you all walking. Stop this, please. We don't want you walking another day. And those elderly women, they said, you know what? We don't feel no ways tired. We're gonna keep walking, we're gonna keep marching. And so that's when I found myself, you know, getting tired and, 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 and feeling bad and, and feeling down on myself. That's when I looked to them and I said, you know what, if they could walk and if they could continue at their age to do it for us, then I have no excuse. You know, I think about Ruth Ginsburg, that woman was doing push-ups like, <laughs> I mean, really, like months before she passed away, doing it through cancer, doing it through chemo, she was still reading, still writing, still trying to do what was just. And I said, I have no excuse. And so I, I, I go back 100 years later, and today I had the honor of being around 
the oldest last known living survivor of the Tulsa race massacre of 1921, Viola Fletcher, who was at a press conference today telling the world, telling the city of Tulsa that she feels and she believes that she deserves justice. Someone at that age who shouldn't even have to be at a microphone, who shouldn't have to be on the front lines saying, I deserve repair. I deserve respect. I deserve restitution. Someone who was ran out of our home, someone who kept it suppressed, who was forced into silence, who was afraid, who didn't graduate elementary school. You know, just think what her life would have been if she wasn't robbed of her generational wealth. Let's just think about it. And here she is a century later. I can't even fathom that a century later at a press conference saying, I deserve justice. And, and I started to, to get really emotional and, and angry. And, and, and we have to ask ourselves why. What is it about Black people in America where we don't get the respect or we don't get the reparations? You have the Japanese, you have so many people that, that received reparations. And, and so I, we stand on the shoulders of Mother Fletcher and Mother Randall, who's 106 years old. A woman at the age of 100, Mother Lessie Benningfield Randall, at 100 years old, she asked, for people in this city to restore her home. Nobody did anything. And then at 105, she told me, I'm getting ready to turn 105 tomorrow and I couldn't believe it. And I asked her one thing, what do you want for your birthday? And she said, I want to look pretty and I want my home restored. And I didn't know at the time she had asked for that same thing at the age of 100. And she lived five years later to ask. I mean, that to me, that's a miracle. And and I said, you know what? I can help you look pretty. I don't know about request number two, um, but I went home, I laid down and it was on my heart. It was tugging uh, at my soul and my spirit. And I said, we're gonna make this happen for her. And we made it happen. We did a housewarming where we sent a link all around the country and people from all over the country sent Mother Randall housewarming gifts. And we redid her home in three weeks. And uh, it was definitely a tall order. It was challenging because it's hard to take away old people's stuff. When she saw us cleaning out that house, she was really upset. I mean, she kept her purse tight in her lap, but you know, don't touch people's things at that age. And so we had to reassure her that we were gonna keep, you know, a lot of her mother's things. She had her mother's, uh, uh, her grandmother's china cabinet. And so we made sure we got that restored for her. But women like that, who's clawed through some of the nation's worst times in history, the Jim Crow era, to make it to this moment, we have to honor them. That's why I love the theme of, of, of this event, this series, In Her Honor. There are so many, so many women. And, and so we can't forget what happened. We can't jump to this place of reconciliation and, and, and this place of, oh, we're gonna build a history center. We're gonna erect a marker. We're gonna put a mural up. And I say that to say that I'm that person that's erecting markers. I'm that person that's trying to build memorials. I'm that person uh, that has a, a huge 3D mural coming, but that's just not the end of it. We have to get beyond symbolism and really start taking action, doing things that are tangible to move us toward the social change that we so desperately need um, in, in this city. You all know the story. I don't have to regurgitate it, but where do we go from here? What's gonna happen when June 2nd comes and all of the cameras go away? Guess what? If it's the Lord's will, if Mother Randall and Mother Fletcher and, and Uncle Red, who is another survivor who's 100 years old, he was six months at the time, we're going to still be fighting for them. We're going to still be educating our children. I didn't learn about the massacre. I didn't know my great grandmother, Rebecca Brown, had to flee in fear of her life. And she jumped on the back of a truck and went to Muskogee. Thank God she survived 
or I wouldn't be here um, today. But they didn't teach me. And I think I went to some of the best schools in Tulsa. You know, I went to Emerson Elementary. I went to Carver Middle School. And I went to Booger T. Washington, all magnet schools. And I didn't learn one thing about the Tulsa Race Massacre. I learned about the Trail of Tears. I learned about Oklahoma history. I learned about US history. <laughs> I learned about pilgrims and Indians. I, but I didn't learn about the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921, not until I, I went to college and I was embarrassed when so many people uh, would ask me, where are you from? And people from LA and Detroit and Chicago and DC would say, oh, you're from Tulsa, Black Wall Street, Tulsa Race Riot, and I had no idea. Came back home and I said, dad, what are these people talking about? And, and I would play it off. I would say, yeah, Black Wall Street. I'm from Black Wall Street. Didn't know, you know, because I was embarrassed and ashamed that I didn't know my own history. And so we have to right the wrongs, you know, for our children and future generations. And we have to make sure we keep the dialogue going and that we continue to educate uh, what's happening. And so um, another woman that I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention is my mother, my very own mother, Leanna Crutcher. Everyone asks Dr. Crutcher, where do you get your strength from? Where do you get your strength from? I didn't know, you know, I didn't know. Um, and I really found out that I got my strength from my mother, a strong black woman. I watched her fight for 30 days, COVID-19. She went into the hospital on December 14th. The very first day they administered the first vaccine dose, we were excited. She had made it the whole year through made it through protests, didn't go anywhere. I kept her safe, I was proud. And she went into the hospital on December the 14th and they told us she would come home in five days once we started the medicines and all of that stuff. And five days later, they called and said, we're gonna have to put her on a vent. She can't sustain any longer, she's struggling. She agreed to go on the vent. And she progressively got worse. And they called us on Christmas, December 25th. And they said, this COVID-19 is like Mike Tyson. It's just too tough. You can't knock it out. She's not gonna make it through the night. They called us into the hospital. Lo and behold, my mom made it through Christmas because I prayed and I said, God, don't take my mom on Christmas, please. And they called and said, we're not sure what's going on, but your mom is tough. She is tough as nail. She is fighting. She's starting to get some kidney function back. She's starting to make urine. We've taken her off of blood pressure medications. She was on four. Now she's just on one. You know, we've weaned her off of some of the vent. Your mom is tough. And I went to the hospital and I said, mom, you better fight. I see where I get my strength. You're a fighter. You're knocking out Mike Tyson. And she kept going and then New Year's came. They called us back on New Year's Day. I don't know what it is about holidays. And they said, she's starting to take a turn for the worse again. She's not gonna make it through New Year's. And we, we have been praying robustly. And lo and behold, mom made it through New Year's. She kept fighting. She kept fighting and then January the 14th, God called my mom home, but he showed me what strength looks like. And, um, you know, I've never experienced an ache like that before. I've experienced my twin brother, which was really painful. My oldest brother died of stage four colon cancer. That was really painful. Had a lot of death, a lot of trauma but there's nothing like a mother's love, a woman's love, you know, and, and it was just different um, to me. And, and we've been struggling. It's been a little bit Mother's Day. Sunday was, was, wasn't too good for us. My first Mother's Day without mom. And, and I was doing well until I went to the cemetery to put flowers on her grave. And, and um, it, it was difficult. It was difficult. And so people need to understand that we don't fight 
just to be fighting. We're fighting for a cause. My mom fought COVID-19 and I believe that this, this did, it didn't have to be so bad. It didn't have to be so bad, it, it didn't. You know, Terrence Crutcher didn't have to be killed, it didn't. And so the policies that Ruth Ginsburg, that she fought for are the same policies that we're fighting for today. The policies that Rosa Parks and, and Claudette Colvin, a lot of people don't know Claudette Colvin, but Claudette Colvin was actually the first woman in history to not give up her seat, but they made Rosa Parks the face because Claudette had a baby at, 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 a, at a young age. And I had the honor of meeting Claudette Colvin in Montgomery, Alabama. And I had the opportunity to serve her when she came to Montgomery, Alabama. And it was just amazing to sit at her feet. But we are fighting some of the same struggles and battles that they fought, that Ella Baker fought. And, and, and so we're not exempt. But when does it stop? When do we stop needing and having to pass the baton to our children's children? And so that's why I fight so hard. These folks did it through water hoses and dogs and, and they have these scars. And Brian Stevenson says that they call those scars their medals of honor. I have a lot of emotional scars, but I know that I can't fight. And so I decided to really make a commitment and make a promise. And, and people don't truly understand the value of commitment. I, I don't think people understand what commitment is. You know, we make a commitment and then we break the promise. A commitment is doing what you said you would do long after the feeling you said it in has left. So a lot of times we commit that we're gonna lose 50 pounds and we're excited and we go to the grocery store and we get our vegetables and, and we're excited and we get our new tennis shoes to go walk and run. And then something derails us and, and we stop. But a commitment is doing what you said you would do even when something derails you, even after the cameras are gone even after the hype is gone, even when you feel weary, even when you feel uh, you can't move forward, even when you don't know what to do next, even when you're vacillating, you stay committed. And I made a declaration that I will until, until we seek justice for whoever it is. And, and a lot of times we, we pick and choose what we get outraged about. We have to stop making decisions daily as to who or what deserves our outrage. Anything injustice deserves our outrage. Black lives deserve your outrage. Black women deserve your outrage. LBGTQ, that community and the racism that they face deserves your outrage. Communities that live in food deserts, our unhoused Tulsans and how they're treated and harmed deserves your outrage. Martin Luther King said at best, a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And right now there is a threat to, to, to folks, to citizens living in this state with this rash of bills, these rashes of bills being passed at the Oklahoma legislature. And what do we do? And people don't know what I do behind the scenes. People think that, oh, Dr. Crutcher's just out there making noise, starting good trouble. Uh, but it's so much more than that. I've put together legal teams to see how we can overturn some of these bills. I have to raise kids now. You know, I'm a mom aunt. You know, that's where I ran to go and, 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 and honor my, my, my niece who, who won a cooking contest. And so she was the first one to be able to shop at the new Oasis Fresh Market in North Tulsa, but I needed to show my face. I have a little nine-year-old nephew who loves to ride bikes to make sure I take him to the bike park, but I'm still struggling, you know, I'm tired. And so one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible is Galatians 6 and 9, where it says, let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. And I cling on to that scripture. I cling on to a quote of another phenomenal woman 
Maya Angelou when she says, we may encounter defeats, but we must not become defeated. Ruth Ginsburg, she encountered defeats like that scathing rebuke that she gave to her, her colleagues on the Supreme Court. That's all I simply do is give scathing rebukes too. When something is wrong, we have to speak up through all of the gaslighting, <laughs> through all of the dog whistles, through all, we have to continue to speak up. I love this city enough to critique her. I love this country enough to critique her because I believe in the ideas of this country. I believe in, in the right to life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. I believe in that. I believe that God created us all equally. I believe it, but there's just so many people who don't. And so I'm gonna continue to believe in the ideas of this country, the United States of America. And I'm gonna continue to hold this country accountable, these systems accountable. And we have to challenge the systems of oppression every single day. And it's exhausting to get up and put your feet on the ground and not know what you're gonna deal with simply because of the color of your skin. It's exhausting. It really, really is. And so, uh, I don't know what I've gotten myself into, but but here's some of the things that I'm doing to try to make Tulsa better. Uh, we are coming up on the 100 year anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. And I've decided to engage in a lot of the remembrance work. And we believe that remembrance is a radical act of love and justice. Simply remembering, simply honoring, giving people proper burials and memorials. That didn't happen for our ancestors. They were dumped into mass graves, dumped in the river, left to be forgotten, erased from the history books, no memorial whatsoever. And I said, you know what? There's been an Oklahoma City bombing memorial, justifiably so. There's been a New York City memorial, justifiably so. But why hasn't there been a memorial for black people who came here to be free and to thrive that were killed at the hands of white supremacy. And so I decided that we were gonna do it. And so in partnership with the Equal Justice Initiative, we've been going around collecting soils, soil at the sites where these victims were lynched, putting our hands in that dirt, honoring them, saying their names. And we hope to display all of these soil jars with the names of the victims, the victims that we know. We'll honor the unknown names as well. And, and, and this display will be in the Gilcrease Hills Museum for, for a few months before they get ready to tear it down. We're also going to be displaying a interactive storytelling exhibit with the last known survivors, Mother Fletcher and Mother Randall. This company or organization called Story File, they went around capturing the stories of a lot of the Holocaust survivors and a lot of the civil rights icon, uh, iconic leaders. And they felt that Mother Randall and, and Mother Fletcher were iconic. And so they captured their stories. And so you'll have the opportunity to ask Mother Randall and Mother Fletcher questions and have a conversation long after they're dead and gone wow. through this augmented reality. It is so cool. And so they'll be on a life-size screen and you'll be able to go and, and view that exhibit at the Gilcrease Hills Museum. And we'll have some of these QR codes around the city, around the district, where you can put your phone up to it and they'll pop off your phone or pop off the poster. And you can ask them questions about what happened during the massacre. How to, you know, ask them so many things. So uh, those are some of the things because we wanna honor these legacies. And then of course, we are putting on the Black Wall Street Legacy Fest, a community curated weekend that centers the survivors, that centers the descendants. Uh, we got a call from the White House. They wanna know how they can engage. I met with Senator Chuck Schumer. I was on uh, Capitol Hill, I think it was last week. I don't remember the days are blending um, in together, but I got to meet Senator Chuck Schumer and, and, and Representative Sheila Jackson Lee and and uh, Representative Karen Bass. I met with Tim Scott and Lindsey Graham as well. Um, you know, you have to figure out 
how you can push and hold them accountable too. Um, and, and that was a, a pretty interesting and painful meeting, but, but we were there and we let our voices be heard. I got the opportunity to meet with Senator Cory Booker. I got the opportunity to meet with Susan Rice, another fierce female leader. It was just so amazing, so amazing to be in the presence of, of greatness. But, but we're hoping that they'll be able to come here. And, and they made a little joke about Tulsa. They said, Dr. Crutcher, if we get the president there, does Tulsa have a runway long enough to land the Air Force One? And uh, everybody started laughing like Tulsa is so small. And I simply responded, just call Donald Trump. Ask him, he can tell you all about it. He was here <laughs> last June. <laughs> and, and so, uh, you know, that, that was really funny, but hopefully they'll be able to come. Um, we're expecting a, a wonderful weekend of remembrance and recognition and honor to pay homage to the lives that were lost and the, the, the folks who are still living. And I hope that you all uh, will participate and engage. I know that Barbara, I have to give a shout out to Barbara Prost, who has pushed me and said, we want to hear from you. We want to hear from you. I know you're busy. I know you're tired, but she's been persistent and her persistence paid off. Um, and, and I am here, but I appreciate Barbara uh, continuing to always give me that nudge and, and really believing in me and believing in my work uh, and, and saying that, hey, it's valuable. We value you. We value what you're doing. And that means so much um, to me. And, and I know she's continued to push through with, with her recent loss. And, and uh, we have to support each other as women, because I'm telling you, this pandemic did a number on us as women. We had to be create. We're already creative creatures. We already do a lot. We already make magic happen. But through this pandemic, throughout this pandemic, we had to figure it out. <laughs> we had to get creative. And, and, and I believe that we did it and, and hopefully we'll continue to, to flatten this curve and, and continue to be mindful uh, of what's happening. But um, there's just so much great work going on. And again, I like to say that I work in three buckets, policy and advocacy, pushing the status quo, you know, trying to push for policy change, community development and outreach, building up our community, teaching our children to believe that they can be great, inspiring them to dream. And then of course, rapid response. There comes a time where you have to get on, on the front line and, and, and respond quickly. You may have to disrupt systems that don't serve us well. We may have to shut down a street and it's not everybody's cup of tea. It's not everybody's flavor, may not be your flavor. Everybody has a role to play. And I know that all souls played that role by making sure that we had water, that we were hydrated, that we could rest, that we had food, that we had nurses on standby, doctors on standby, people praying. Everybody has a role to play in this fight. What role will you play? What role will you play? We stand on the shoulders of giants of people that did it through trauma and pain and sickness and grief, but they were committed. They said, I will until, and so I'm just taking on the baton and I pray I don't have to keep passing this baton down to my great nieces and nephews. I pray I don't have to do that. That's the goal, right? Will we ever get to a post-racial America? But it's gonna take all of us. And it's gonna take white people understanding the privilege that they have, that you have. It's no longer acceptable to not understand and realize the privilege that's been given to you because of the color of your skin. It's no longer acceptable to not know. And once you know, you owe. Once you know, you owe. And so I'm gonna pause for a second and get a sip of water and uh, see if there's any questions because I can talk for hours on the generational trauma that has reverberated through my family's history. I can talk for hours about the fight for justice and police accountability. 
I can talk for hours about my mother who lost the battle to COVID-19, who will never see justice for her son. I can talk for hours about having to pick up and uproot my life and come back home and try to be a mom aunt. I can talk for hours about the work that I continue and try to do to just be a blessing to others because it's a part of my healing. And so I'll pause and uh, open it up for any questions and pray that I can answer. Thank you so much, Dr. Crutcher. Please take a drink. That was amazing. Whew. And we do have some questions coming in on a lot of what you have spoken of. Um, one thing, we'd, we'd love to know your thoughts on um, Governor Stitt being part of the, the Tulsa Race Massacre Centennial Commission and the credibility of the commission overall. How, what are your feelings on that? What steps um, have been taken? What steps can be taken? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you for asking me about that. Um, I'm, I'm not quite the bandwagoner. I've <laughs> been pushing Governor Stitt before. You know, I even knew he was on the commission. I've pushed James Langford before I knew he was on the commission. You know, I, I stay pushing Mayor Bynum. Uh, and, and so to, to find out that we had all of these people on a race massacre commission, not just those three, but you had Kevin Hearn and Mark Wayne Mullins and all of these people on a race massacre commission, individuals, politicians who won't utter the words Black Lives Matter. If you look at their voting record, they have yet to vote for something that, that, that actually benefits BIPOC communities. In fact, they've voted against everything that the commission stands for. And so it's a simple question to me, why are they there? Why are they there? Why are they allowed to center themselves on a commission and, and they don't believe in reparations or repair or respect? And, and so that's a problem within itself. And so it's just not Governor Stitt, it's Mayor Bynum who doubled down on Governor Stitt's bill. It's Mayor Bynum who allowed Donald Trump to come to our city on Juneteenth weekend and allow an indoor rally to hear the rhetoric and, and to force workers who are elderly and most of them African-American to have to go and work in that BOK center and be exposed to folks who don't wanna wear masks. James Langford, who was a part of the commission to, to reject the election uh, results, marginalizing black and brown voters, marginalizing the work of black women like Stacey Abrams. James Langford, who wouldn't sign on to the resolution that Elizabeth Warren introduced regarding the massacre. You're on the commission and you wouldn't even sign on to it, supporting it, acknowledging the massacre. To me, it's really common sense. Why would you even wanna be on, the, on a commission like that? And so for the people who are coddling that white supremacy, for the people on the commission who are complicit who are afraid to tell them to step down, we have to look at you too. I supported the commission at one point in time until I started to see what was happening, until I started to see that the community really wasn't at the center of it. The survivors really wasn't at the center of it. Again, we have to get beyond just material things and structures. There are people still living there are descendants that are here, should be about the people, should be more about the community. Community should have a voice. And I'm really big on people with the lived experiences having a voice and being centered and it just not being about the status quo. So to be quite honest, I don't believe that the commission cares about us and what we think. I think they care about a museum and I'm all for public education, I am. I think it's necessary. I really do, but it, it has to be so much more than that. And I believe that, that they all need to step down. They all need to be asked to step down. 
Who are we trying? What relationships are we trying to preserve? When people show you who they are, believe them the first time. Uh, Governor Stitt put out a message um, saying, hey, I, I don't think he's got, he's doubling down. You know, I, I, I don't know. But all we have is our voice. And I always tell people, you have to draw a line in the sand and, and pick a side. Will you be on the right side of history or the wrong side of history? And that's where we are in, in our community uh, as a descendant myself. And survivors, we said no more. We're gonna take back our history. We're not gonna let people exploit our legacies. These are our demands. You've raised money off of our legacies and you didn't include us. I always tell people I, I spent time, um, I was a candle lighter at the, um, uh, um, the Jewish Federation of Tulsa to commemorate the 6 million Jews that were lost during the Holocaust. And I was one of the candle lighters. And they told me they would never allow somebody else to build a museum in honor of their people. Every museum that's been built, there's been reparations attached to it. Not here. They're talking about cultural tourism and capitalism. Who's benefiting? Not the North Tulsa community. And so our demands are Hey, let some of those proceeds go to the survivors who are living. There are 107. Every day is a gift. Let some of the descendants be a part of the board of directors for the museum. I think that's fair. And anybody that's not a descendant, let's make sure that they have a proven track record on fighting for justice and equity. I, I, I really think that's fair. And so that's what we're demanding. And we're asking you all to echo those demands. If you believe in justice, and I know you do. And so governor did, he's shown us who he is. I mean, let's just not, I mean, the anti-protest bill, I mean, yeah, they need to go. They need to just cease and desist. That's how I feel about it. What can, um, what sources should we be following what news sources should we be following to, to get the, the best information? Well, the best information, you mean just here locally in Tulsa? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. The Black Wall Street Times um, is a good source to get, get information. The Oklahoma Eagle. I mean, the Tulsa world is balanced, of course. Um, um, so yeah, I think those are, are good sources. I think you should follow certain Facebook pages if you're, you know, based on the area or scope of work or, or what you're interested in. Um, we're going to start doing better on the Terrence Crutcher um, Facebook page. The Met Cares, they're into a lot of different work as it work streams as it relates to housing and economic development. And, and, and so there's so much going on. I, I just actually helped secure uh, a huge grant for the community, uh, a justice and economic mobility grant. Um, and hopefully we'll be launching um, that soon. Um, but this is to help people impacted by the system or people engaged in systems work and justice work and uh, who's trying to mitigate mass incarceration. This is to help us continue our work. And, and, and this was a fund created by the Ford Foundation the Schusterman Foundation National and Blue Meridian Partners. And, and we secured, and, and the Terrence Crutcher Foundation was a part of that, a $20 million fund. And we hope that it's just a catalytic fund where we'll get more money to continue to do um, the work that's so desperately needed, even in a state that's so red, um, um, where we don't feel like our voices are heard, but we understand that it's gonna take people power to get this done. It's gonna take building community power and transformation it's gonna take a narrative change to reimagine what public safety looks like and how we talk about crime and, and criminality. Um, because of course there's this fear mongering um, that's out there and we have to abolish that and, and, and really get to the root causes and, and ask why are people stealing food? Why are, but, but you know, what's the problem? Why are people homeless? Why are people turning to drugs? You know, and, and so how do we change the narrative around crime and criminality? Yeah, I do believe that people who commit murder, uh, people who, 
who 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 uh, uh, rape kids and things of that nature and commit violent crimes. Yes, that's what we should be fighting for sure. But these these crimes where people are trying to survive, we have to figure it out. It's it's all because of systemic oppression and racism and the systems that are in place and and the laws and the policies that are in place. And so um, I don't even know what the question was. I'm sorry, I just started <laughs> rambling. Well, we'd love to know, is there is there a place to to sign up for calls calls to action for, um, yeah, just, just to, a, a hub to get involved? Absolutely. Well, I see Carolyn, uh, Carolyn is on the phone, Ekin Sam, who has been a great partner uh, with us on the front line. She shows up and uh, with action uh, with that group and Chris Moore, really great group to get involved with. But we're gonna actually start as we build out this plan, there's definitely gonna be some calls to action. Some immediate calls right now is we need volunteers for the Black Wall Street Legacy Fest for May 28th, uh, May 30th, May 28th, 29th and 30th. I will send over to Barbara, Dee Dee and, and, and Shannon the link for you all to sign up. Actually, Greg Robinson is, uh, I have him leading that volunteer apparatus. Uh, but we're going to need people everywhere. We have a summit going on. We have a luncheon going on. Uh, we have mass distribution sites and uh, it's just so much to do. And so we're going to need volunteers um, to help us. And, and I was supposed to actually have the link to drop in the box today, but it's been a busy day. But I will make sure I get that link for you all to join us. I actually have All Souls as one of our community partners uh, for the Black Wall Street Legacy Fest. And so um, we're only just a few weeks away and we need for people to start signing up to volunteer. We have t-shirts for you all and and uh, it's gonna be a, a hard lift, but we've brought community together and, and see that's what it's all about, bringing community together to truly honor and center the, 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 the survivors and descendants. And so that's what it's all about. We have a huge event on Sunday um, that we're excited about. So I will make sure I get that link to you all after this. Again, Greg Robinson is, is leading that with the Met Cares Foundation and the YWCA and so many other partners. And we want for you all to help volunteer. But as we start to build out this justice and economic mobility strategy to continue to push for policy change in this city, we will keep you posted. The NAACP Legal Defense Fund just released a report. I'll get that over to you all so you can see. A lot of you all were there when we did the equality indicators meetings, the public hearings. We finally released our report with our recommendations and, and I'm excited about it because we were able to really capture the voice um, of the people who, who were impacted by uh, negative interactions by police officers. And so um, looking forward to sharing that with you as well. So there's so much to do, so much that we've done, but I think the immediate ask right now is we need help with the Legacy Fest for the 100 year commemoration activities. <laughs>